processors, that's something that we all desperately need because without them, what would we do with our computers? Nothing. They wouldn't work. There would be nothing to work. And hey, Ryzen is just around the corner, so let's take this moment to remember the top 7 worst CPUs ever made. Now I'm not saying that Ryzen will be among them soon, just that it would be a good time to remember what some of the absolute worst CPUs ever made have been. Oh and there's been a lot of them. I decided to not include uh, the things that aren't sort of x86 based and the things that aren't made by companies that are now making shoes and just focus on the the, the big ones you know the the intel amd side of things because other companies used to make cpus they don't anymore well not for desktops they still make them for supercomputers and stuff and i'm not going to include power pc either because who really cares about macs and consoles that being said let's get it started with number seven the covington celeron series back in the old days when pentium 2 was a new thing intel decided it needed something in the low and something to compete with those cyrex processors that would sometimes just crash your system if you decided to play an mp3 or the amd stuff so they decided to create a cut down version of the pentium 2 that would replace the low cost pentium mmx and that cpu was the celeron yes it was a cut down version of a pentium 2 but you had pentium 2 performer so why was this one of the worst things ever made oh yeah they didn't include l2 cache none like none not a little all cpu in Celeron series, Duron series, Sempron series include less cache than the CPUs whose cut down versions they are. So they don't perform as well but cost less and justify the higher cost of the full processor. Or at least that's the marketing slogan. But this thing, the Covington Celeron, did not include any L2 cache, like at all. None. And you know what that meant, right? Oh yes, it performed worse than a Pentium 1. It was less powerful than a thing it was meant to replace and i've got a sneaking suspicion that i'm gonna say that again quite a lot in this show number six the intel atom c2000 now this is actually something recent like it happened last week intel announced that the atom c2000 series which is quite commonly found in a bunch of stuff doesn't really have as long a lifespan as previously believed because keeping it running accelerates degradation by a lot and the, the physical connections in the processor break down now this series was launched about four years ago so yeah these cpus are now currently dying and they're not the kind of atom you find in tablets or phones no these are in routers these are in security systems these are in switches these are in stuff that shouldn't break without notice out of the blue and thing is that the processor can still run even when the first of those connections start to degrade but if you reboot it it's dead and will remain dead forever because it can be fixed it needs to be replaced and people were afraid that they would degrade their cpus by overclocking them well you don't even need to do that anymore number five the intel itanium back before we had x86 64 which is the instruction set and the implementation of 64-bit computing that we now all use there was the intel itanium now this thing was gonna be big this thing was gonna be a revolution a revolution this thing was gonna be the cornerstone of enterprise product you wanted 64-bit for your company servers you had to get an itanium thing is they didn't really work that well especially since it didn't actually have compatibility with x86 code so it had to be emulated slowly and then amd came with the opteron that brought 
x86-64 and killed it, murdered it. it. It killed it so badly that Intel that made the Itanium decided to ditch the IA-64 instruction set in favor of the AMD thing, because it was better. Now to be fair, the Itanium was developed alongside Hewlett Packard, so it's not entirely Intel's fault for making a product that's not all that good. They've done a lot of products that weren't all that good in the past, like the IAPX432, which honestly I doubt anyone remembers and uh, probably isn't even worth mentioning. Number 4. The Intel Pentium D. I owned one of these crap thirds up until the year 2012 and oh boy let me tell you, owning one of these was not fun. It was on my work PC, the one they gave me instead of a salary, back when I worked for the first online television station in this goddamn country. One where the boss, instead of uploading things to, you know, video hosting sites on the cheap, even YouTube was just showing up then and we could upload 15 minutes at least, he decided to make his own uh, hosting system on rented servers that cost us a bunch and we didn't get paid, but that's a whole other story. The Pentium D. This was basically two Pentium 4s slapped together with spit and mucus. It didn't work that well in terms of dual coring. It didn't work that well in terms of single coring. It didn't work that well, period. It ran at about a bajillion degrees and it got murdered by any subsequent Intel CPU, even the lowest end Intel CPU in the next generation outright eviscerated it and wore its ass like a hat, which was something that the dual core AMD CPUs were doing for years, up until Intel made the Core 2 series. Now placing this so high on the list because I owned one of these third fests may be a bit biased of me, but if you owned one of these, you know just how much of a scan it was, how much of a piece of crap this CPU could be. Speaking of which, number 3, the AMD FX 8120 and the FX 9590. Basically Bulldozer. When AMD launched Bulldozer, expectations were so goddamn high. I mean, the thin at its peak, the Phenom 2 had a 6 core part that ran okay. It, it wasn't great, it was kinda late and Intel was catching up, it was doing actually quite great in terms of multi-core CPUs, so Intel needed something big, so they made a new architecture, one that had a bunch of cores, well they weren't actually cores, they were modules because they shared the FPU but they had separate integers, so uh, the result was that their top of the end CPU, the 8120 20 was underperforming compared to the Phenom 2 at higher clock rates and they were stuck with this architecture. They improved it a bit with the uh, next iteration, they went from Bulldozer to Piledriver, which didn't really change all that much and in Piledriver they weren't just content with making a crap CPU from the FX8120, they made the FX5990, the 9590. This thing would murder motherboards. If you did not plump this into a motherboard designed to handle a TDP of over 200 watts and there weren't a lot of them, you would fry your motherboard and it was still not performing all that greatly even at 5 gigahertz because the architecture itself was kind of crap for what people generally use them, you know, for games and stuff like that. The main problem was that Bulldozer itself wasn't really built for desktops, it was more of a, uh, oh look, now I've got something that can run 50 virtual machines and not, oh look, this thing can't run Total War. No, really, it couldn't run Total War, like Shogun Total War, the second one, it couldn't run it. And they said that yeah, that maybe there are some things with the timing software in Windows that the 
CPU schedule didn't work properly and they patched it and nothing improved. Bulldozer just continued sucking for the last six goddamn years. Yep, six years since AMD made a new architecture. Six years in which it just about died. That CPU basically killed it. It's sort of a zombie now and it's trying to claw its way back to life. Number two, the Intel screw-ups. I would have said fuck-ups, but I want to keep this show family-friendly. Otherwise, you know, they'll pull our advertising so we can make those 10 bucks we do on shows at best. Like, in a year, they maybe make 10 bucks, but... The Intel screw-ups, two major ones at least. The first Pentium had a bit of a uh, design flaw. There was a divide error where if certain numbers were divided in the CPU, they would cause an error, like an actual error. Th they would give out the wrong result and then crash because, you know, generally the programs needed the correct answer and entering the wrong one would just cause it to go boop. But even though it affected a lot of CPUs, it was wasn't all that common to get that error. But you know what was common? Getting a similar error with constant crashes in the Pentium 3 1.13 GHz edition. And this is the more flagrant one because Intel really went nuts because of this. Or maybe not because of this, but around this time. It went a bit nuts. When journalists like the people at Tom's Hardware reported that there was an error with the CPU that it could not finish benchmarks without crashing. Intel sort of uh, blacklisted them and people on the internet were saying, well, why are you on a tirade against Intel? The Pentium 3 is superb. I know it's only been out a few weeks and I don't have one to test. But it's Intel, they don't make bad CPUs. But they kind of did. It took a few weeks until everybody started noticing this error and uh, Intel itself had to admit the error existed and recalled a couple of hundred million words of CPUs to fix the error. And what was it? Oh yeah, it withheld information about the announcement of the Pentium 4 from the people that reported the bug. Which leads us to number one, the Pentium 4. This CPU did not perform as well as the one it was supposed to replace. The netburst architecture was the bulldozer of its time. It was crap. It continued to be crap when they turned it into the Pentium D. But this CPU is the absolute worst ever made because this marks the time when Intel turned absolute asshole. When Intel broke the law multiple times to to compensate for the fact that the Pentium 4 was crap. Just so you can understand, the Pentium 4's only advantage was that it could go to higher clock rates in the Pentium 3, but its architecture would actually not let it be more powerful per hertz. So if a Pentium 3 and a Pentium 4 were clocked to the same frequency, the Pentium 3 would just murder it. So they had to clock the Pentium 4 as high as possible and then hope no one noticed. People noticed. So then Intel just went, well, okay, people notice. Let's stop others from noticing. So they did three main things. They kind of bribed uh, system makers to not use AMD parts, for which they kind of got sued by several governments. They bribed benchmark makers, like the company that produces a benchmarking software. They bribed Sysmark to optimize the benchmark for their CPU, to make the Pentium 4 seem better performing. Again, the government government had to intervene and now every Sysmark benchmark that Intel or any other official company publishes must be accompanied by the disclaimer that this benchmark is optimized for Intel. And lastly, of course, there's the Cripple AMD bit in the Intel compiler which is used by basically everybody. A bit that's... Uh, let's check it out. Is it still there? Yep. And according to the court files, Intel can't be obligated get it to change the compiler in the USA, so they probably won't ever do it. Also, the Pentium 4 would seem like less of an absolute third. It is a third. Like, even if you mask it, 
if even if you put it on stilts and dress it up like a person, it's still a turd. You can't weaken that Bernie's the Pentium 4 even though Intel tried so hard to do it. Illegally hard. Well, that would be it for the top 7 worst CPUs ever made. Let's hope Ryzen won't be among them. Well, actually, let's hope Ryzen doesn't actually come out to be better than Intel's current offering, because if it's gonna be better, Intel may go back to its old tricks and um, bump from everybody that owns an AMD CPU by throwing its money at people and manipulating code because when you've got a monopoly can anyone really touch you of course not thank you for watching this show if you enjoyed it please consider watching some of our other videos and maybe sharing them or giving a thumbs up if you feel like it and if you really really liked what you saw please check out our patreon page for just one dollar a month you could help us make much better shows and get some rewards in the process or you could consider buying my book called tale of doom volume one is out now and available for just two dollars and as always if you thought it was horrible you know where to find me and complain about it